comment. FYI, um, our streaming has been down this morning, and it's, uh, it's a problem that uh, originated uh, outside of this building, and uh, it should be up any moment. But if anyone asks about the service, and they, they were a friend of yours, and they were watching, but they didn't get today's service, you can go onto our website, and there's a place there where you can watch the services after the service. Which, by the way, if you didn't know that, see, you can go home after the service and you can say, did he really say that? Did, did he really say that? Well, you can find out. You can just watch it all over again if you'd like, okay? God is good. So last week we started on the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and we really didn't get much past the introduction. In fact, we didn't really get through the entire introduction. But we have two key scriptures, and I think any time that you, you have a study on the Holy Spirit, you always need to make sure that these two scriptures are read and understood. And the first one is uh, 1 Corinthians 2.14. Let's take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. But the natural man, let's say this together. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. You must always understand this, that you cannot sit down and logically talk with someone who is not a born-again believer or who does not believe in the things of the Holy Spirit, if they believe that the things of the Holy Spirit passed away many, many years ago, it will be very difficult to get them, and according to Scripture, basically impossible to get the natural mind to understand the things of the Spirit of God because they are spiritually discerned. Nor can they know them or understand them now, that word for know there uh, is gnosko. It is the Greek word that talks about intimately know. It's not talking about head knowledge. It's talking about in their heart. Very intimate knowing. You know, the Bible talks about when a man and a woman come together. It talks about many times, and, and so-and-so knew his wife. That doesn't mean he just recognized her. Like, oh, that's my wife. Now that's not what it's talking about. It's talking about they had intimate relations. That's what it's talking about here. It's the same word that is used. The natural mind can't intimately understand the things of the Spirit. Oh, they may intellectually kind of understand. So you must have a desire in your heart to know the things of the Spirit of God. For all of you who know my background, you know that I have a major in theology at, at a Baptist university. You know that I, to this day, technically, I'm still a licensed Southern Baptist and ordained Southern Baptist minister. I pastored a Southern Baptist church, and there was a time when I thought people like us were mentally ill. And I did not understand the things of the Spirit of God, because I believed that everything that took place in the church in the first century was just kind of a transitional thing that moved us into the more intellectual area that we were in. But the reality is it wasn't a transition. It was the spark and the seed that was sown for the church so that the church can grow in the things of the Spirit of God, and we should be stronger in the things of the Spirit now than what they were then. I'm always a little amused when somebody comes up to me and says, oh, I'd like to have a church just like they had in the first century. If we could just get back to that early church experience. No, not me. Hey, the people who were filled with the Holy Spirit Shortly after Jesus departed, 
they didn't have the Gospels. You know, they didn't even have the concept of the church being the body of Christ. They didn't have the concept of spirit, soul, and body. They didn't have the book of Revelation. I mean, there's so many things. They didn't know about the rapture. They didn't know very much at all. But they were hungry. And see, and that hunger and thirst for the things of God and that willingness to move in the things of God should be more so now. See, we should be better equipped now than they were. Right? The second scripture that we need to always remember is Acts 1.8. One of the last things that Jesus said before he ascended, he was talking with his disciples and with his friends, and he started to float up into the air, and he left. Now, as he was leaving, and while he was talking about this, is when he ascended, and here's what he said. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. But now this witnessing that's going to take place, this whatever it is that's going to take place, is going to take place after you have received the power and after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. The Greek word for power there is dunamis. It's, it's, it's where the word dynamite, dynamo, all those words come from. It, it's a power. It's a power. So even though there's a lot of confusion about the things of the Holy Spirit, there should not be confusion about the Holy Spirit because he is not confusing. He is God. Remember, the Holy Spirit came upon a young girl named Mary and impregnated her. The Holy Spirit is the Father of Jesus. You say, well, now that can't be because the Holy Spirit's just the Spirit of God. No, once again, the Spirit of God is God. Your Spirit is you. You are your Spirit. You're not detached from your spirit. It is, it is you. Ephesians tells us that the Father, the Word, that's Jesus, and the Spirit, these three are one. We must understand that there's different functions within the Godhead, but this is going to sound almost like a paradox, but they are one there's all kinds of illustrations we can come up with that kind of tell about that how it can be they all fall short they all fall short uh, but one example is water h2o h2o uh, it can be vapor it can be liquid it can be ice it's still h2o It could be vapor. And sometimes looking out over the Lake of the Ozarks early in the morning in the winter, sometimes this lake freezes over, you can see the ice, you can see the water on top of the ice, and you can see a vapor. They're the same. But they're different. Um, myself. I am a husband, I am a son, and I'm a father. I'm still the same guy. But I treat my wife different then I treat my mom and dad, and I treat my children different than I treat my wife, and there's different functions. I share with things with my wife, I submit to things with my parents, and I rule over my children. Okay, but I'm still me. Well, we need to understand, and all of these things fall short. I mean, you can find error in all of these illustrations. But the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, these three are one. All right, we need to understand that. Now, we know that the spirit world is actually the real world. We, we need to understand that God is a spirit, 
John 6, 63. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The spirit world is the real world. If God is spirit, then God was in the spirit world. Still is, but he was, he was in the spirit world. And in the beginning, while in the spirit world, he created the physical world. So the physical world that we are in right now, in some ways you could say it's the secondary existence to the real existence. We are operating in this physical world in restricted bodies. Our spirits are contained within our body. As a born-again believer, according to the Bible, the Scripture even tells us, don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you, lives in you who? Lives in your spirit. So our spirit is contained within our bodies, and these bodies are restricted. However, God's plan is for us someday to be in bodies that are not restricted. Someday we will be in bodies that will be like the body that Jesus has right now who he is operating in all realms, all realms physical, all realms spiritual. He is not restricted by any dimension. Wouldn't it be nice to not be restricted by the first, second, or third dimension, the fourth dimension, or have to listen to songs by the fifth dimension? You know, <laughs> um, it, look, Dimensions, the Jews, many of the highly intellectual rabbis, they believe that there's up to 70 dimensions. See, we, we try to limit God to the physics of man. But with God, there can be physics that makes our physics seem like it's nothing. We're just now beginning to understand things like quantum physics, and mechanical physics, and and um, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and it was void. And darkness was on the face of the deep. And listen to this, in Genesis 1, 2. And the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the waters. The Spirit of God hovered over the face of the waters. See, in the beginning, we can find where the Father was here and the Holy Spirit was here in the beginning. And then in John chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word. And it goes on to say, And the Word was with God. And what? And the Word was God. And then it goes on to say that everything that was created was created by Him. Everything. Everything in every dimension. That means that the Bible tells us in Ezekiel chapter 28 that Lucifer was perfect on the day that he was created, but the reality is that word created, he was created. Angels were created, and there was a day before the day they were created when they didn't exist. There was a time before angels existed, and in that time before angels there was the father the son and the holy spirit and these three were one and are one and will always be one wow so let's take a look uh, we're going to go at this from a little different angle but last week i defined for you the nine gifts of the holy spirit and let's take a look at first corinthians chapter 12 verse 4 and we're going to start reading there, and we're going to go from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4, down to verse 11. And at first, we're just going to read this. And let's read this out loud together, all right? Verse 4. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit, all right? Verse 5. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. Verse 6. And there are diversities of activities, 
but it is the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another, discerning of spirits. To another, different kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. Hallelujah. Let's take a look at the verse number one of this chapter. 1 Corinthians 12, 1. It says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. Once again, Paul said we should not be ignorant concerning these spiritual gifts. Now, uh, just take a look at your Bible. Don't look at the screen right now, but just open your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and take a look at verse 1 out of your Bible. You'll notice it says, now concerning spiritual gifts. You see the word gifts there is italicized. Do you see that? Uh, the other words in that chapter are not italicized, but the word gifts is italicized. What that means is, is that word gifts is not actually there. It was added by the translators because in their opinion, it fits the flow of the passage to put it there. And anytime you're translating from one language to another, sometimes more words are used in one language or less words to convey the same thought. I remember being on the, the elevator and with Cole Stringer in Australia a few years ago, and there were some people there uh, for a convention, and they were all from Japan. And so I asked Cole Stringer to ask this lady if their convention was in the hotel. And so he asked her, or someone that was there asked her in uh, Japanese, and she went, and she just went on and on and on. And I looked at Cole and I said, what did she say? He said, no. <laughs> so, you know, it really made me realize that sometimes it takes more words to say something in one language than another, or less. Are you following me? So when you translate, you, you need to do this. So... But don't let that throw you off, because if you read later in the context of the Scripture, you will see that it is talking about spiritual gifts, although in the actual language there it says spirituals. Uh, I do not want you to be ignorant concerning spirituals. But it's, as you read it in context later, you'll find out it's talking about spiritual gifts. All right. Now, the word ignorant is, the root word of ignorant is ignore. If you're going to be ignorant of something, many times the reason is because you ignore studying it. How many of you went to school? Let me tell you something. If you went to school and you took algebra, but you never learned anything, it's probably not because you're not smart. You've got to be smart. You're here today. But it's probably because you ignored studying algebra. What you ignore studying, you, you become ignorant in. If so, you know, there are people who like computers and people who don't like computers. And you can just ignore a computer, just completely ignore it. Well, when it comes to things of a computer, you're ignorant. Why? Because you ignored it. Paul is saying here, don't ignore 
the things of the Spirit. Don't be ignorant. Don't ignore this. You must study these things. You must understand these things because they are important to you in your spiritual life. And then let's go down to verse 4 where he actually starts talking about the gifts. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. What this is telling us here, that there are different kinds of gifts. Some may present themselves boisterous. Some may present themselves quiet. Some may present themselves in a perfectly intellectual way. And some may present themselves in a way you think, whoa, this person's been, you know, they've been drinking. <laughs> but let me tell you something. Even though there are diversities of gifts, it's the same Spirit. It's the same Holy Spirit. So don't necessarily be thinking that just because a gift presents itself, the Holy Spirit presents a gift in such a way that it makes the person look good. See, these, these gifts, and we'll find out in a few moments, the purpose is not to make you look good, or me. The purpose is not to make it look like we are spiritual, or to like we know more than somebody else. Arrogance should never be a part of it. But we need to know these things. We can't be arrogant in our understanding either. Have you ever been around somebody that knew more about something in the Bible than you? And they became what the Bible calls puffed up. Don't be that guy. Don't be that gal. All right? Verse 5. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. There may be a different way that a ministry is presented. Everyone who operates in a certain gift may not operate it in the same way that someone else operating in the same gift operates in. You know, God's going to call you to be you. I mean, in the early days of my ministry, back when I was the pastor of a Southern Baptist church, I tried to stand like Billy Graham. I tried to have his accent. I tried to say, I practiced. This is, I practiced saying the words Scripture the way he did, you know. Turn into Scripture is, you know, and because he was my hero. And it's okay to imitate your heroes in the faith. You know, Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. That's okay. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. But the reality is uh, what the Lord told me. He said, I didn't call your imitation of Billy Graham. I called you. And you be you. And God's going to use you. And so gift number whatever operating in you, Laura, may be presented a certain way out of your spirit where that very same gift, that very same gift may be given to someone else. See? And they may, Christy may operate differently. You say, well, wow, that's two different gifts. Well, maybe the same gift. But there will be a difference in the way the ministry is presented. Well, let's, let's go ahead and look at verse 6. There are differences of activities. But we need to understand this. But it is the same God who works all in all. See, don't, don't judge somebody in their operation of the gifts of the Holy Spirit by whether or not they function in it like you do. Different Different cultures operate in the gifts, it appears like in a different way. But by the Spirit, it is the same Lord, it is the same Spirit operating all in all. I've been to several different countries. There's a lot of things that they do in other countries that everybody does that are just completely different. I remember I was over in a, in a far eastern country not too many years ago, 
And I, I said, I asked somebody where the restroom was. And they told me where it was. I went to this room and I looked around. I went back out and I said, where'd you say it was? They said, it's in there. Their bathroom wasn't like our bathrooms. Are you following me? <laughs> you know? But everything still happened the same way. That's what, way too much information. <laughs> but, but you know what I'm saying. The same spirit. <laughs> okay, let's just get that out of your mind, okay? Okay. Verse 7. But the manifestation of the Spirit. Now, let, let's, let's pause here for a moment. The glory of God is the manifestation of God. When the Bible talks about the glory of the Lord was present in the Bible, that is telling us that there was a manifestation, something was seen, visible, something was there that let us know that God was there. The glory of God is the manifested presence of God. When the glory of God came in, the, the Shekinah glory, came into the temple, and the priests could hardly stand up because of that glory. Well, what was that glory? Was it just a smoke cloud? No. It was the manifested presence of God that they saw, and it affected them. Well, the manifested presence of God is the glory of God. But here it's telling us that there is a manifestation of the Spirit of God. What is the manifestation of the Spirit of God? Well, it's getting ready to tell us that the manifestation of the Spirit of God is wrapped up in these gifts. See, now, everything is not always what it seems to be. There are people who fake the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. There are people that fake the manifestation of God. There was a church over north of the lake here, and the name of the church many, many years ago back before this church was started, or about the same time, it was called the First Corinthian Church of Love. Great name for a church. And they asked me to go out there and speak. Well, it was out, and, uh, it was out north of Versailles someplace. Has anybody ever been there? Okay, a couple back here. And uh, they had two big wood stoves that heated this church. Um, the wood stoves were right in the middle. Everything wasn't where it was supposed to be. I mean, the wood stoves were right in the middle of the sanctuary, one near the front and one near the back in the middle, and the bathrooms weren't in the building. So, I mean, you know, like everything wasn't where you would think it would be. And, uh, but at any rate, while I was preaching, uh, one of the wood stoves, it was in the middle of the winter, one of the wood stoves had the pipes that went all the way up to the top, and at the peak of the church, the, the pipe went out the top of the church, and evidently the pipe had gotten a little rusty or something. It had gotten a little, and it, it kind of shifted. And uh, the smoke started coming down that pipe on the outside of the pipe at the back of the church, into the church. And looking toward the back of the church, you could see that smoke coming down. It was just like a cloud coming down, you know. And it started filling the church up kept coming up toward the front. And this one lady turned around, and I never will forget this, she turned around and she goes, it's the Shekinah glory, it's the Shekinah glory. And I'm thinking, no, the smoke pipe broke. <laughs> you, you, you know what I'm saying? Well, you know, we can, we can do things and try to make things happen, but there is a real manifestation of the Holy Spirit. There are things that you see there are things that are tangible, but don't fake it. You know, it's kind of like going to the Bible study, and you know, everybody's in a circle, and you're all singing some deep spiritual song, kumbaya or something, you know. And, and then somebody's kind of got their eyes half closed, and they've been staring at the light a little bit, and they see the capillaries through their eyelids, and they kind of make out some kind of a vision. 
you don't have to fake. Let me tell you something. You don't have to fake the things of the Holy Spirit. They are very extremely real. They are very extremely pronounced. And when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you don't have to, when it's all over, you don't have to think, was that the Holy Spirit? When the Holy Spirit is present, you know it. You don't have to work up the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not an emotion. You know, it's, it's not about gritting your teeth and clenching your fist. No, that's not how the Holy Spirit comes. I'll show you in a few moments. All right. But there are diversities of activities, verse 6. But the same, but the same God who works all in all but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one, how? For the profit of everybody, for the profit of all. Who benefits when the Holy Spirit manifests himself in one of these gifts? Who benefits? Everybody. I've heard people leave a meeting and say, well, I sure wish I would have got a word. You know, old brother Clarence and sister Susie, they always get a word, but I never get a word from God. Well, you know what? And you never will. Because Jesus said, you get what you say. In Mark eleven twenty three, And if you keep confessing that the Holy Spirit never does anything with you, and yet, you know, I just, I just don't get it. Well, now listen to me. Jesus said, you get what you say. Mark eleven twenty three. 23, he says, if you believe in your heart, those things you say will come to pass. You will have whatever you say. That was, Jesus said that. So what we say out of the abundance of our heart is extremely important. We need to, we need to start expecting God to manifest himself. We need to expect the Spirit of God to manifest himself and not try to work it up now now follow me you can create an atmosphere for the Holy Spirit you can create an atmosphere for the things of God you can you can create an atmosphere that hinders it too now I can tell you right now if Ted would like to have a kiss from Shirley and he goes home man. and he goes home what he doesn't do is not shave not shower eat a big bowl <laughs> eat a big bowl of chili and some cobbler <laughs> take off one sock leave one sock on put his feet up on the chair and watch football and get potato chips all over his mouth and not brush his teeth for two days. He hasn't created an atmosphere to get a kiss. <laughs> Are you following me? The atmosphere. Now, she, does that mean she doesn't love him? No, she loves, she loves him just as much as she ever loved him. But he just didn't create an atmosphere for a kiss. Okay, now, wash all that out. The next day he comes home. He shaved, showered, got a little splash of, of cologne. What's a good man's cologne? Somebody name something. Ralph Lauren? So he's got a little Ralph Lauren He's got one rose in his hand and two tickets for dinner at a nice restaurant with a view overlooking the lake. And he says, Shirley, will you be my date tonight? He's created an atmosphere for a kiss. <laughs> Are you following me? Now, it's the same Ted and Shirley. Are you following me? It's the same Ted and Shirley in both of instances and they love each other just as much this has nothing to do with their love for each other it just has to do with creating an atmosphere 
When it comes to the things of God, we can create an atmosphere that includes God and His Spirit, or we can create an atmosphere that rejects Him. I mean, back in my early days, I remember we had the church bulletin. Now, the church bulletin we have now tells you upcoming events. The church bulletin we used to have when I pastored the church back in the day had a minute-by-minute minute countdown till it was over. And if it wasn't in the bulletin, buddy, it didn't happen. Somebody even has an announcement to make. Well, you didn't get it to the church secretary by Thursday, so you have to wait another week. I mean, we knew everything to the minute. They might as well have had a stopwatch on that service. And if the Holy Spirit would have showed up, and I say this respectfully, they would have duct taped him and put him in the back room because there's no way they're going to let him do anything in the service. <laughs> the Holy Spirit, manifestation, the gifts are for all of our benefit. So don't, if you went to a, a, a service and the Holy Spirit manifested himself now trust me every time christians get together the holy spirit's there because he lives in you all right so it's not a question of whether he's there or not the question is whether he manifests himself or not through one of the gifts and he will do that and when he does everybody in the room should benefit you say well somebody received the word of wisdom and they gave it to this person over here let me tell you something. You listen too. You can benefit from the moving of the Spirit. For to one is given the word of wisdom. Now, at verse 8, we're beginning to get into the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to ask Angie's help in the uh, video department, which Angie is, I just can't hardly say her name without thinking about the awesomeness of what she does and the hours and time that she spends, and, and she's just a, a wonderful lady, and, and I just think, you know, get her a Starbucks sometime. I mean, this, this girl, she's great. This, this young lady is awesome. But uh, we have some graphics, and uh, the gifts are divided into, if we take the nine gifts, you can divide them into three groups of three. And uh, I think she has a graphic back there that shows these gifts. Uh, the first gifts are what they call the gifts of speech. There's three gifts that are the gifts of speech. Here they are. Excellent. Isn't she amazing? The gifts of speech. See, we don't get together and rehearse this stuff. You know, all these scriptures that she puts up there while I'm teaching, I mean, she finds them. From the time I say the scripture, she finds them and gets them on. Isn't that amazing? And she has assistants back there, and uh, I'm not sure who's helping her back there today. Is, is it Alicia? Alicia's back there today. Well, Alicia, we love you too. All right. <laughs> and, it, and it's teamwork in everything that we do around here. It's teamwork. All right. But there's the gifts of speech. Now, these three gifts, you could basically say that they say something and i think what i'm going to do right now is i'm going to define the gifts for you uh the three gifts that say something the very first one is prophecy and i'm going to try to have these definitions simple but still clear prophecy is the supernatural utterance of the things of god in a known language so if I say something to you by the Spirit of God, now we're talking about the gift of prophecy. If I say something to you by the gift of prophecy, or if you say something by the gift of prophecy, it will be spoken, something that is spoken, in a language that you understand. If you are a Japanese person and prophecy comes to you, it will be in Japanese. If you are... Russian, and you're in a service, and the word of pro and prophecy is spoken, the gift of prophecy is spoken in that service, it will be in Russian. 
It will be in something that you can understand. The second gift of speech is different kinds of tongues. What we want to do here is we want to call the gifts what they actually are. Uh, sometimes I've heard people say, well, the gift of tongues. No, it's not the gift of tongues. It's the gift of different kinds of tongues. Here's what this is. This gift is the supernatural utterance by the Holy Spirit in languages never learned by the speaker and not understood by the mind of the speaker nor necessarily understood by the believer or by the hearer. So if, and there are different kinds of tongues. In other words, the gift, if you just said the gift of tongues, that would be the impression that it always happens the same way every time. But different kinds of tongues, and you will see as we go back through these individually and explain in detail each one, you will see that there are different kinds of manifestation of tongues, all right? And then the third gift of speech is the interpretation of tongues. It is the supernatural interpretation by the Holy Spirit of the meaning of the utterance that was presented in that unknown language. And this interpretation is in the language of and understood by the hearer. Now somebody may say, well, are these two different people? Well, they can be. You can have a person operate in the gifting of different kinds of tongues, and then somebody else would operate in the gift of interpretation of tongues. But the scripture also says that when someone operates in the gift of different kinds of tongues, that that person should pray that they themselves may interpret. So a person can operate in these gifts blended together. And I'll show you, we won't get to it this week, but I'll show you in weeks to come where many times there's a blending of two or three or even four of the gifts and you see this magnificent manifestation take place and you say, well, which gift was that? Well, that may be the gift of the word of wisdom operating with the word of knowledge that's operating in the working of miracles and the gift of faith along with one of the gifts of healings and they operate together for the benefit of all, all right? The next three gifts I would call the gifts of power. Now, while the gifts of speech say something, the gifts of power, they do something. And the first one is the gift of faith. It is, now look, there, this would probably be a good place for me to interject this. These gifts have parallel Let's put it this way. There's the parallel flow of the Holy Spirit. While there is the, the gift of faith, there's also natural faith. And even though natural faith is supernatural, I'm talking about it's, it's something that is available to you that, that you develop. Um, Romans 10, 17 says, So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. You can increase your faith and grow your faith by the hearing of the word of God. If you need faith in the area of healing, you read scriptures on healing, and hear scriptures on healing, and that builds your faith. You need help in the area of finances. You read what the Bible says about your finances. You hear it, and that increases your faith for finances. But you do that. That's not what this is talking about here. The gift of faith is when something happens and all of a sudden you believe beyond your natural ability to believe. 
I have been in situations, now I'll, I'll give you some of these illustrations as we get to detailing these, but I've been in illustrations where in the natural to look at it, it's like, you got to be kidding. But by faith, by the Spirit of God, I knew that I knew that I knew and everything in me knew and I acted like I knew and everybody in the room probably thought, oh, he does this every day. The reality is, is God gave me the gift of faith to believe for something beyond what I had natural faith for. So there's the gift of faith. This is a supernatural endowment by the Holy Spirit whereby God increases the faith of a believer for a specific person and then God honors that purpose miraculously. Oh, only for the lack of time, I want to give you some illustrations here, but we'll get to these as we go back through these individually. The second gift of power, which is our fifth gift, is the working of miracles. It is the supernatural intervention into the ordinary course of nature a temporary sub suspension of the accustomed order of creation through the Spirit of God. In other words, physics are set aside and something happens. There is a gift called the working of miracles. And it is not something you learn to do but once again, with all these things concerning the Holy Spirit, you can set the atmosphere for it, or you can set the atmosphere for it not to happen. And many times, the beginning of the atmosphere is what you say. If you're in a situation and you say, well, that'll never happen, somebody says, uh, what did the doctor say? Well, they, they said... Uh, they said, there's no hope for me, I'm going to die. Well, how do you feel about that? Well, they're probably right. Well, let me tell you something, you're not setting the atmosphere for the gift of the working of miracles to take place. And then the third gift of power, which is our sixth gift in our, in our list, is the gifts of healings. Multiple gifts, multiple types of healings. And they are for the purpose of delivering the sick and destroying the works of the devil in the human body. The next three gifts, seven, eight, and nine, are the gifts of revelation. The first is the word of wisdom. Once again, I want to compare the parallel flow of the Holy Spirit. Yes, you can get wisdom. According to the Bible in the book of James, does anyone lack wisdom? That's what it says. Does anyone lack wisdom? Let him ask of God, who gives what? Liberally. To who? To the one who asks. You need wisdom? Ask God. He'll give you wisdom. You know, I don't know what to do in this situation. Lord, give me wisdom. He'll give you wisdom. But that is not the gift of the word of wisdom the word of wisdom is the supernatural revelation by the Spirit of God concerning the divine purpose and will of God and it usually works with the next gift called the word of knowledge the word of knowledge is the supernatural revelation by the Holy Spirit of certain facts that are from the mind of God yes there is wisdom and you can get this wisdom by studying the Word and becoming wise. And according to the Scripture, by hanging around people who are wise. But then there's supernatural, the Word of wisdom that comes by the Spirit of God. It is a gift. Likewise, knowledge. There are things, you can go to school and get degree after degree after degree. But in no way in the world will that allow you to walk into a room and know something that nobody else knows that's a hidden secret that the Spirit of God reveals to you. And boy, do we have some illustrations on that. And then the last gift in our section of 
gifts of revelation is the gift of discerning of spirits. And discerning of spirits is being able to see into the spirit world and understand the personality and or the purpose of a spirit. You know, many times when something happens, it's not the person who's doing it that's the problem. It's the spirit behind that person. Uh, when Jesus looked at Peter and he said, Get thee behind me, Satan, he wasn't calling Peter Satan. What he was doing, he was saying, Get out of my way, you spirit that I discern is here right now that's affecting this man named Peter. You will, a very practical thing, discerning of spirits, not everybody who says, Lord, Lord, is of the Lord. I've been in situations where seemingly somebody who was uh, attempting to do something very spiritual, the Spirit of God let me see into the realm of the Spirit, and I saw the Spirit behind it, and I knew that I knew that I knew to not associate myself with that particular ministry or person. How is that? Because there is discerning of spirits. Now, this is not, and there is no such thing as, the gift of discernment. I've heard people say, well, I've got the gift of discernment, and you're an idiot. You know, well, <laughs> I discern you're an idiot. You know, uh, I think I shared this a couple weeks ago, but I, I was in, uh, was doing a meeting. I believe it was in Ottumwa, Iowa, and a, a minister came up to me, and I reached out my hand to shake his hand. He said, "Oh, I can't shake your hand, brother. He says because if I shake your hand, I'll know everything about you." And you now he was in the elevator. He was getting so spiritual that it was made me gag. And. Uh, you know what I'm talking about? And, oh, I can't touch it, man. That's like, when I shake hands with people, I know everything about them. Well, I said, well, there's nothing wrong then. Shake my hand. And he started telling me stories. And I couldn't wait to get that elevator door open. Oh, I just shook the hand of a lady and I... And I the man was operating in demonic spirits. All right. So we have these nine gifts. Uh, let's take a look at something else here. Verse 11. But one and the same spirit, this is 1 Corinthians 12, 11, but one and the same spirit works all these things. How many of these things does he work? Who works them? But the one and the same Spirit works all these things. Does it say you work them? Who works them? Does it say you work them? You make the atmosphere. You make yourself available. But he is the one who works them. And who does he distribute them to? Well, I tell you what, there's some churches that just don't like this next part of this verse at all. But he distributes distributing to each one so he distributes let's say sherry here she has created an atmosphere for the holy spirit to manifest himself in her he has nine gifts and variations of all nine and she has through her lifestyle and and through the way she is living and the way she worships she has created an atmosphere for the holy spirit to she's to allow him to step into her life and distribute any gift. It says the Spirit distributes each of these gifts individually as he wills. Well, let me ask you something, and, and I believe I have revelation on this. He wills to distribute all of his gifts to all of us. It's just he has problems finding people who have created an atmosphere and who are willing to allow him to move in such a way that you pull yourself completely back and you are not concerned about how your hair looks 
when you were given that word, or, ha, ha, you know, I know, but how'd I look? You know, it's not for your benefit. It's not to publicize your ministry. The gifts are not to be used to make your ministry bigger or to make you more well-known or, or to make you some kind of spiritual hotshot or to make your church the spiritual church in the community. They are for the benefit of all of the believers so that we can live our lives in such a way that this world is drawn to Jesus and that the church can be strong. And the gifts of healing, what are they for? Well, the purpose of the gifts of healing is for people to be well. It's, it's not for us to be spiritual hotshots. And it's not like, well, how many people did you get healed at the last meeting you were at? It's not about you and how many people you. The Scripture tells me it's the Holy Spirit working through us. And He distributes them as He wills, not as you will. We just need to be available. And remember the Scripture earlier today. I'm going to close with this. You can go ahead and close your, your notebooks now. Ephesians 4.11, remember that? The purpose of the pastor, your gift. Different kind of gift. But it's kind of a spiritual gift in a way. The purpose of this gift to you is to equip you for the work of the ministry in your lives. And I don't want you to start thinking of, let's go to church and move in the gifts of the Spirit. No, 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 no. Don't make yourself available and ready for the moving of the Holy Spirit at 9.15 on Sunday morning and start scrubbing yourself down and saying, ho, 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 can't wait to get the church to move in the... No, no, every day. You say, well, what if it happens at work? Well, according to the Bible, remember the Bible? It's for the benefit of all. I guarantee you, if you have somebody you're working with and they have a, a chronic pain in their shoulder and it's, it's been that way for so many years that, that they can't hardly think sometimes and you're at work and in your life, even though stuff's going on around you, in your life you've created an atmosphere for the Holy Spirit to manifest Himself. And you're standing there at the lunch counter, and you're getting your coffee, and they're standing next to you, and the Holy Spirit distributes. Let's say, for example, He distributes the gift of knowledge first. Maybe you don't know anything about that shoulder. And the Holy Spirit says to you, open your mouth. And you turn and you say, have you had a shoulder problem? Maybe you, now that's knowledge. That's knowledge that you couldn't learn in school. It just happens. Do you have a shoulder problem? And the person goes, well, yeah, but I've not told anybody but my doctor, my family, but nobody else knows. Why? Then the word of wisdom kicks in. If you let me lay hands on your shoulder right now, you can be healed. Now, see, that's coming out of your mouth. It's nothing you plan. The knowledge and then the, the wisdom to take care of it. Now, see, it, it all hinges on them. If, if they start saying, get away from me, fool, you know. Well, you've, you've done what you can do. You know what I mean? You can't force somebody to receive something. But if they go, sure, yeah, that'll be fine. And then you lay your hand on their shoulder. And you don't do a Smith Wigglesworth restaurant thing where you jump up on the table and, in the name of Jesus, glory to God. No, you don't, you don't necessarily have to do that. <laughs> Are you following me? You don't have to do that. You can just put your hand on their shoulder and say, in the name of Jesus, be healed. Okay? One of the gifts of healings kicks in. Different gifts of healings. One of the gifts of healing kicks in. Now, healing, now keep in mind, healing is a process. When you go to the doctor and they give you a shot, you go in, you got to, you got to, 
And the doctor gives you a shot, you don't go, thank you. That was, that was good. No. They give you the shot, and you walk out the same way you walked in. You walked in, they give you the shot, you walk out. Okay, but the healing stuff was in you, and the healing begins, and it's a process, and over a few hours, it's like, I'm feeling better. Okay? Now, so healing, healing is a process. Are you following me? It's a process. But miracles is instant. So you say, in the name of... Now see, all this time you're doing this, it's like, this is going to work. This is going to work. That's because the gift of faith kicked in. And you're believing beyond what you've studied. Yeah, I mean, you just know that you know that you know. I mean, you're not like, I hope this works. No, you're not like that because... Faith, the gift of faith kicked in. The gift of the word of knowledge kicked in. The gift of the word of wisdom kicked in. The gift of healings, the gifts of healings kicked in. And then, if they're healed instantly, now see, you could have done all of that and the, their pain still been there and they went home. That night it got better and they came back in the next day and say, it's been years and last night it all went away. Well, that would be the gifts of healings. But also, the gift of the working of miracles kicks in. And not only did the, was it like a shot and they started to get healed? No, it was like, they are healed. It's like the pain's gone. It's like, whoa! Now, how many gifts of the Holy Spirit were in operation right there? Are you following me? But the manifestation of the Spirit was for the profit of everybody. Now, I'll tell you something. He, the person doing it feels great because all of these gifts are operating. But don't get cocky. It was the Holy Spirit doing it. Okay? Then this person has changed their life. You say, well, that person had to be saved. No, they don't necessarily have to be saved. They could have been lost as a goose. But that may be the thing that the Holy Spirit did so that they go, wow, how'd that happen? My arm. I've never been able to move it like this. What'd you do? You just say, uh, it's just the power of God. God's real. I guarantee you, people will be drawn to God if we allow God to do through us. See, now, first century church, one thing that they did have going for them is they just believed everything that God told them. And so they, they didn't hold back. But see, we've become so educated, so educated, you know, we just, and we worship at the altar of intellect, but not anymore, because we're going to allow the manifestation of the Holy Spirit to always be, we're going to be, we're going to create that atmosphere in our lives. Yes, it will happen in church. It will happen in church. It will happen. It has happened, and will continue, and, and I believe even to a greater degree. But the Holy Spirit and God, you know, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are not relegated to Sunday morning. Or, as Billy Brim said this week, uh, we have regular church on Sunday morning, then we allow the Holy Spirit to move on Thursday nights. No. We don't say... Holy Spirit can move here and not here. I've actually had ministers come up to me and say, since you guys broadcast, what do you do concerning the things of the Holy Spirit? And I just want to say to them, are you mental? You know, that, that should not affect a thing. Somebody say, well, it doesn't look good on camera. Well, who cares? Yeah. We're not doing this for the camera. The camera may record what we do, but we're not doing this for the camera. We're equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. Stand up. Hallelujah. Well, did you learn anything today? I believe that there will be a greater manifestation in your lives. And it will come in our church, too. Because some of us live here. 